yo yo what's up guys welcome to Sparklight with Pavi um this is a new thing uh if you guys don't know I myself am covering the LA Sparks um this season uh honestly just after the Clippers coverage we had like um kind of when you start doing the reporter thing it kind of got the like reporter bug it was really kind of cool so I didn't want like the whole summer to go with me not covering anything or like me or just us on the behalf of Hoofs and Brews and HNB Media not covering anything um so the opportunity arose and uh there was an opportunity for us to cover the LA Sparks um and it kind of piqued my interest because I'm not gonna act like I've been a avid watcher of women's basketball my whole life. I'm just getting to like my life basketball history. Um, I was raised by my grandmother um, and my godmother. Um, and my grandmother actually was a basketball coach. She tells me the story all the time about how I forget what year it was. I'm sure it was like in the 50s or 50s or 60s, something like that. She tells me a story all the time about how she coached her team to the championship. I think there was like a bad like traveling call and they ended up losing. And um, my grandmother was one who actually put me on the basketball. Like that was her in my household, like watching all the 90s Bulls games, um, all the earliest memories of basketball I have uh, involve her yelling at the TV screaming Carl Malone is a dirty player, um, yelling about Michael Jordan's game-winning shots. So women introduced me to basketball, and uh, when it comes to the Sparks, I was excited to take it because, for one, I mean, they have Derek Fisher coaching. Uh, I mean, that's somebody that I've watched play basketball pretty much my entire basketball life. When I knew what basketball was, I also probably knew who Derek Fisher was. Um, so there's that name. I um, mean, also Candace Parker. Uh, I mean, I, I, I was even talking to like some of my homegirls, and I was telling them that, you know, I'm covering the L.A. Sparks. And the one name that everybody knew was Candace Parker. Candace Parker, um, I remember uh, when I went to the actual WNBA draft coverage that the uh, Sparks uh, threw. Um, Derek was talking about how Candace is one of the greatest basketball players ever. Like, regardless of gender, just like ever. And I wanted to agree. She was a great college player. I mean, I, rem I, I, I remember Candace going back to high school. I remember watching her at the um, McDonald's All-American game when I think it was her and J.R. Smith, if I'm not mistaken, were the two names that were in the um, dunk contest. And she won the dunk contest. Um, and that kind of, like, piqued my interest on, like, Candace. So, um, her being there, they also have um, Nuneka, they have uh, um, Elena Beard, so they have a they have a really really good cast of people, and also the LA Sparks. Like when you I mean when you think about women's basketball as far as like the WNBA, I think the LA Sparks are probably the first franchise you think of. Um, you know, like it's not like it's uh, you know like the Dallas Wings or something like that. That's no disrespect to the Dallas Wings, but. I mean, just it's just saying, like, if, if you if you want to compare it to the NBA, it's like the Lakers or Celtics. Like, one of the first franchises you think about when you think about the WNBA is I would think the Houston Comets. Uh, you probably uh, think of the Minnesota Lynx, and you think of the LA Sparks. Um, so, I mean, obviously Lisa Leslie, like they have a great basketball history here in here in um, LA. So, I mean, I, I I was jumped at the opportunity to do it. And I was um, very excited to cover it. Um, and also, when it comes to women's basketball, uh, I don't mind watching it, actually. Actually, I think that the women's game is um, a little bit more... They pay much more attention to details and um, fundamentals. Obviously, because it's not as above the rim as um, the men are. Uh, I feel like a lot of the... A lot of the men's game, you don't have to be as fundamentally sound because, like, I mean, if you can, if you're six seven and you can run like hell and you can jump forty four inches in the air, you don't really need as good of a grasp on the fundamentals um, as you would uh, in the um, women's game. So, I mean, even going to the practices, like the one thing that um, Derek Fish even said himself that he was shocked at how much the team communicates. And I even noticed that, like, I, uh, granted, we, we don't get to sit in um, the whole practices. Uh, you know, we we, we probably come in, I, I want to say, like, like the last fit, 10 to 15 minutes of practice. But the one thing that I do notice is they talk a lot. They talk a lot on defense, which um, any coach will tell you the first sign of a good team is communication. You have to communicate. You have to talk and let people know what you're doing. Um, and that's one thing that they do. They seem to talk a lot on defense. Um, so... 
Again, I'm very, very excited uh, about this season. Um, the, their first preseason game is actually will be Saturday, uh, which is May 11th. They will be playing um, uh, the Phoenix Mercury. I won't actually be at that because it's at Phoenix, so I won't actually be at that. But yeah, I'm very, very excited uh, um, about this season, and um, I know where they can go. Like I said, they have a great cast of members. Um, they got Nuneka and Chinny, uh, the two sisters. I don't know if you guys uh, how familiar um, you are with them, but Nuneka was the MVP in 2016. If I'm not mistaken, let's check that. Make sure it's 2016. Uh, she was the MVP in, yes, 2016. So they have two MVPs on their roster. They have Candace, who was an MVP in, um, want to check out the year for you guys. Make sure I'm not just saying stuff. Um, she was the MVP in, actually, she's a two time MVP, 2008 and 2013. So they have two MVPs, um, Elena Beard is two-time defensive player of the year back-to-back -back. so they have a very very good cast of members they also have kalani brown um who she was a part of the baylor championship team uh she was their first round pick i think she's like six seven the center so they have a very very strong front line and also their guard play uh the guard play is nice um one of the girls that i actually um enjoy watching i actually got a chance to talk to her uh, i'll play the clip for you guys i got a chance to talk to sydney weiss not as uh, I don't know how um, familiar um, you guys are with her, but she's a guard. Uh, she was actually the Pac-12 all-time uh, three-point record holder. So in college, in the Pac-12, she had more threes than anybody. Um, she's somebody that, granted, I haven't. Again, I, I've, this is probably I've been to maybe I want to say three practices, but <clears throat> I made it a point to pay more attention to her after um, talking to her. And I enjoy watching her play. She has a very, very smooth game. Um, obviously, she can shoot. And uh, I actually asked her um, about what else she tried to add to her game um, besides shooting. And this was the response that she gave me. I'll go ahead and play it for you. Obviously, you've always been a shooter. But is there anything else that you tried to um, add to your game on um, this offseason that could really help you this season? Yeah, actually, uh, I was in Israel for the overseas season, and uh, the team that I was on, I was actually playing one through five. And so I'm I'm used to, not really used to, I'm used to more being on the on the wing or being point guard, bringing the ball, of having the ball in my hands. But uh, I understand at the pro level, sometimes you're asked to be something that you're not used to. And so getting that experience over there, whatever they need from me, I'm willing to do that, willing to learn as fast as I can and provide whatever I can for the team. Uh, but I do, I love being point, I love being on the wing, uh, just being able to set people up for success and whether that's me nailing a shot, getting an assist, uh, just taking care of the basketball and so um, I'm comfortable being in that combo guard position and I, I just really focused on making sure my handle is ready because we have a lot of good defenders in this league. Okay. Yeah, so um, Sydney Sydney's definitely a player that I'll be looking out for. Um, like I said, I just I honestly just like the way she plays. I think she has a very very smooth game. Um, she talked about being a combo guard. You can like kind of see that she doesn't really. She's about I think if I'm not mistaken six feet. So that's in WNBA you can kind of play the one or the two or sometimes even the three. Um, at six feet, so I just like the way she plays. That's a player that um, I'll be watching. And getting back to Derek Fish, I know I mentioned the um, communication that they like some of the similarities, what well, the the differences and similarities between the men's game and the um, women's game. He actually talked about um, about that. I went to practice on Friday. Uh, it was the 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 last practice before they actually had a preseason game. It was kind of funny. They had like a referee there. Um, the funniest part of practice actually was. Um, uh, that they were doing I, th I think I came in and I think they had like two minutes left in the game they were playing I think they were going over plays and uh he ran something and Candace like traveled and they had referees Candace traveled like clearly traveled and she turned around like what do you mean I traveled and everybody was like girl like stop like it was hilarious to me personally because I'm sitting there in the stands like no you literally travel like why are you even contesting that but it was just cool to see cool to see some of the um, intensity so you understand that like yo the season's getting closer uh, but I do want to play this clip from Derek Fish it's about a two minute long clip in this clip he uh, he was he was asked about his next tenure what did he learn from his next tenure and he also was asked about pretty much the, the differences and similarities between the Knicks and um, between the Sparks. It's about two minutes long, but uh, check it out. Cam, being here with the Sparks compared to when you're with the Knicks? Um, similarities, some of the greatest basketball players in the world. <laughs> like, uh, 
uh, regardless of gender. Um, these are the best basketball players in the world by far. Um, very, very smart, high IQ, um, and take the game very seriously. And, and so, you know, those are similarities. Um, I think the differences are uh, uh, pleasantly surprising. It's like um, the level of communication um, and how this particular team at least holds itself accountable um, internally, right? Where it's not always me or an assistant coach that is delivering a message that the team needs to understand. Um, you know, and uh, I feel very fortunate to have a team that is wired that way. And, um, but I didn't realize how much they talk to each other, yeah. you know, <laughs> and um, uh, it's a great thing to see so far. Uh, is there anything you learned from that Knicks job that you can kind of apply here with the Sparks? Um, I think understanding that even though it's, it's, uh, it's team sports, it's professional sports, uh, it's about winning, you know, games, etc. But um, establishing relationships that are based in trust and love and respect and appreciation. That kind of is consistent, you know. And in New York, I was still learning how to do that. Um, and and I'm, I'll always be learning. But I feel like I learned, you know, how to be better in those areas in terms of um, being able to develop relationships with the whole team, individual players, um, their communication staff, how they learn. And, and then also learning to trust my instincts. You know, uh, you, know, you get a chance to do something that doesn't quite work out, and then you get another chance. Um, those things that you learned, uh, that you knew, you felt like would work well, and now having the opportunity to do some of those things, um, I'm also enjoying the process. Um, so, a couple of things interesting about what he um, said there. Uh, one uh, was talking about his next tenure. Um, I think that sometimes what we forget, especially fans and some media members alike, is that coaches need time to grow just like players do. If I'm not mistaken, I think he got the Knicks job. I think he stopped playing and then started coaching the Knicks. Not just any franchise like the Knicks. Not like you stopped playing and coached the Timberwolves. You stopped playing and you coached, you know, some uh, G League team. You stop playing and you coach the Knicks in a transitional period. If I'm not mistaken, even Carmelo was hurt half of that year. So there was really, and it feels in office, feel wants you to run the triangle. So it, it was a tough situation that I don't know if anybody could have really succeeded in. Um, and again, I just think that just like players, coaches need time to grow. He talked about, you know, that um, he maybe didn't value or didn't understand the value in, uh, you know, actually having actual real relationships with the players and, you know, some of the staff and um, some of those guys. And you know what? I, I think he's learned from his mistakes. Um, even when I talk to him in practice, he always seems to have very insightful answers. Uh, you know, he, he seems like he has a, a, a better gauge on more, 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 more freedom uh, I think that, you know, trying to, like, run out, like, I mean, he even said it, like, yo, I, I, I get a chance to, like, trust my instincts more. I think that maybe, like, you know, with Phil um, being up top, uh, also being in New York, you know, Phil wants you to run the triangle. You feel a little bit pressured to do that. Um, I think that that weighed on him a little bit. And he's in a, and he's in a situation here now, like, look, it's not the NBA. Now, granted, it's, it's still the WNBA and, like, one of the most storied franchises in, you know, um, in uh, WNBA history, but it's not like playing in New York, coaching, we're well, not coaching in New York, coaching for the Knicks. <clears throat> I don't think there's anything in basketball in general besides maybe coaching for the Lakers or playing for the Lakers that's like coaching or playing for the Knicks and the um, level of scrutiny you'll be on, especially as like a, a first time coach. I think this is a situation where he can grow as a coach. And like I said, I think we always forget that just like players, Coaches need time to grow too. Um, you know, Larry Brown wasn't a great coach day one. Uh, you know, Pop didn't win a ring day one. You know, uh, hell, Phil Jackson didn't, you know, come straight out of uh, playing for the Knicks, go to the Bulls and, you know, win a ring day one. That's not how it happens. Like, they need time to grow and time to um, adjust to. And I think that he'll have that here. Um, and also, uh, he pointed to it as well with the differences between 
uh, you know, the men's game and the women game is um, communication. Like I said, like, I think they actually have to communicate more, more because they aren't as athletic. So they have to have uh, just as high of IQ, if not a higher IQ, because they just don't have the same level of athletic ability. Like there's been so many times during the playoffs where one of the like, granted, I I never played basketball at like a you know extremely high level, but I did play in grade school and my first two years of high school started in grade school. I actually one of the better players on the um, team in grade school, so I played um, organized basketball before. One of the very, very first thing you that that you learn is to talk, especially when it comes to screens. Call out the screen. Let somebody know there's a screen coming. I can't tell you how many times this playoffs I've seen somebody get completely, absolutely drilled by a screen because nobody communicated and call it out. Most of the times when I'm in practice, I don't see that. I see you know them communicating, letting everybody know what's going on, and 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 you know maybe like that's because. The way w- women are taught the game is more fundamental, so they're they're more um, keen to uh, you know these small little nuances uh, of the game. Maybe it's because they also you can't even go to the WNBA until well you can't enter the draft until you spend three years in college. So also obviously like a lot of the you know NBA guys they really don't know the game like that coming in because they really haven't been taught the game. If you think about in high school, if you're a phenom and you play AAU, you're not really being taught. You're kind of just playing. The teaching goes on kind of in college. And with the one and done rule, like how much teaching do you think that these athletes are really getting like taught the game? Like most of the time it's like, yo, you come here, you're going to play for these three months and then you're going to be gone. Uh, with you know the women's game, no matter how good you are, you're there for three years. When Candace was in college, if I'm not mistaken, she spent three years at Tennessee with Pat Summit. So I'm assuming the knowledge that you would gain, you know, playing in a system and in a college for three years instead of just you know three months, helps you when you get to the um, next level with the simple nuances of the game, just like calling out screens and you know um, things like that. So. Uh, again, I'm not going to act like I'm some 100% professional when it comes to WNBA. Like, look, this is my, this, this will be my first year, you know, really watching it um, extensively. I must say that, I, you know, I wasn't in years prior. Like, you know, the WNBA was a thing that if it was on and I wasn't doing anything, I would turn it on. Or like when it was a final, like I would watch the finals. I remember the classic uh, game seven uh, between the Minnesota Lynx and um, the LA Sparks when I think it was Luneka who had the tip uh, the, uh, the uh, tip back. You know, there's also names I know, obviously, like any of the phenoms, like I would know, but I'm not going to act like, you know, I'm uh, the, the uh, damn Hubie Brown of the WNBA right now. But, you know, hopefully you guys can uh, take this journey with me. You know, and we both learn and we both grow and we both become more knowledgeable about the women's game. Because like I said, man, it's, 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 it's actually really, really good basketball. Like once you get past the fact that you won't see any real above the rim play and you actually, you know, look at what's going on, look at the plays being ran, look at the systems, look at the schemes. It's actually really, really good basketball. And actually, I got a chance to um, ask Derek Fisher about uh, um, if there's any you know, a uh, uh, player that he thinks that, you know, uh, once he gets them in the uh, system that uh, that uh, uh, he can maybe bring out some skills or bring out some talents or make them a better player. And this was his response to my uh, question. Obviously, a system sometimes can, t- can take players to um, different levels. Is there anybody on the roster that you see that now that you got in camp, got a couple practices that you see that your system can maybe bring out something to them that maybe they didn't even know that that they had in um in um their game? Um, great question. I mean, I guess we'll find out. Uh, you know, I'm I'm trying to you know just help all of our players see that um, you know if if we can pay attention to detail and we can do some of the smallest, simplest things at a high level in terms of improving our spacing in terms of putting passes on time and on target, uh, in terms of communicating at a high level on defense. Um, that is not always as much about the fancy system, whether it's the triangle, the UCLA, the flex. They did, like, there are so many great ways to play basketball in terms of that part. Um, but if you're not paying attention to detail and you're not executing, you're not setting good screens at the proper angles, none of it works. Um, so I'm trying to you know, kind of impress upon them the importance of those things 
And hopefully over time, they'll see that that actually is what changes your game in a lot of ways, not necessarily, you know, this fancy X and O's that the coach is bringing to the table. Uh, one thing I'm happy uh, he said is the screens. I, mean, I know, like, me and Thomas have had this argument on um, hoops and brews a lot. But, you know, it's, like, really, really the small things, like learning how to just set a screen. Like, that's so important. Like, I'll see some, so many games, like, Yo, you could have really got this man open if you just would have set a better screen. Like that's that's so important. So I'm not. I, I, I don't. I don't necessarily know right now. You know what system uh, he's one one um, one hundred percent trying to run. I don't think he's running the triangle. I'm pretty sure that he may implement some. You know some aspects of the uh, triangle. You know that's something that he's played in uh, for a vast majority of his playing career. Uh, tried to implement it in um, New York. So I don't know if that's, that's going to be like 100% the system um, that they're running. I'm not, again, I'm not sure about the system that they run, but one of the things that I see when I go to practice is they're just working on like the basic fundamentals. They're working on defense. They're working on being in the right spot. They're working on setting screens. They're working on just like the small little nuances to the game that in the long run, they have a, a huge impact. Like again, you can run the pick and roll is like the the the, the oldest play in basketball, literally like the oldest play. If you <clears throat> and it's still the most unstoppable play. <clears throat> if you the the uh, a pick and roll from the from the 1960s and a pick and roll from 2019 will work the exact same way as long as you as 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 uh, long as everybody is spaced correctly and the guy who's setting the screen is a willing screener. You know, so some things, like you said, some things aren't so much X's and O's. It's just about knowing the game and being willing to um, do some of the, the uh, little things. But also that comes with, you know, knowing your teammates. Like I said, they have a bunch of new acquisitions. Uh, you know, Kalani, uh, she's new. Uh, uh, Chinny, they just made the trade for her. Um, so I've been going around making it, um, making it a point to kind of ask... Uh, you know some of the girls. Uh, uh, you know if 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 anything about their new teammates have uh, you know surprised them. I just got a chance to ask Candace that question today. I'll uh, play her response for you guys real quick. Um, is there anything? Is there anything that's kind of um, shocked you about some of your new teammates? Maybe something that you didn't know they were as good as, um, and then you get in practice and you see that they're that that's something that they can really do really well. Yeah, I mean obviously everybody coming in. Uh, no, I know them pretty well. I think just getting to know our draft picks, you know, Marina, Kalani, seeing what they can do. Um, Gabby, her length and athleticism. Uh, and just Marina, her ability to shoot the ball and, and things like that. So I think everybody's just kind of figuring everybody out to, to put us in the best position to, to play. Because I think it's hard to first adjust to new teammates, where they like the ball, do they like to go in for the jump shot, that type of thing. So, yeah, um, you know, uh, as she said, like, it's, again, the s small things, like the thing that she mentioned. Um, one of the things that I noticed, this was from actually watching uh, a lot of LeBron um, when he was uh, in Cleveland with Corver, is usually when LeBron passed the ball to Corver for a three, he would make it. And a lot of that was because LeBron said that he looked and would, like, go and watch film of, like, where Cal Corver liked the ball to shoot it. Like, what was Corver's shooting pocket? And again, those, uh, what she said, like, yo, uh, finding out where teammates like the ball to shoot it is a huge thing. Like, that's a small thing that in a long run, you know, when, when um, you're in the fourth quarter, you know, when you're in the finals, when, you know, you're, um, when, you're, when you're in these moments, it's not so much about the system that you run. It's not so much about the play call. You got to go out there and hoop, and it's like the small things. It's about – because, I mean, again, at that stage, everybody has scouted for everybody. Everybody knows what you're going to do. There's nothing you're going to, you know, shock somebody with when you get into the finals or, you know, the playoffs or game 25. You're not going to reinvent yourselves or pull out something new. So it's the very, very small nuances and nuances and the very, very small details that have a huge impact. So like I said, man, I'm really, really excited um, and if you guys don't know, actually, we have two sisters on the Sparks, which is um, Nuneka and, uh, and uh, Chene. And I actually have a video of her talking about what it would be like to play with her sister. Um, I don't know. I'm trying to think. I, I think really the only time I can remember two siblings playing together. I know like the Drogic brothers played together in Phoenix. Uh, the Morris twins played together in Phoenix uh, as well. 
um, with the Suns, but I can't really remember too many times in basketball that two sisters, well, sisters or siblings in general, have played on the uh, same team, and um, this is what she had to say about playing with her sister. Oh, yeah. I mean, we've been, we played on the highest stage at the collegiate level, and so now for us to be able to do that at the professional level is um, not only special, but I think um, historical, you know, and it would be really awesome for her to also get her own championship, especially here with the Sparks. Now we don't have to root for two different teams trying to go for a championship. Now we can all keep it in the family. Again, I, I, I think Derek has his uh, work cut out for him. Again, they, they, they have a lot of parts. They have a lot of interchangeable parts. But I think the one thing that will help him out is, like, you have veterans. I mean, you have, look, look Elena, she's, I think, if I'm not mistaken, 35, 36, um, two-time defensive player of the year, been, been in the league. 10 years, you got Candace, arguably, you know, the greatest women's player ever, or definitely one of the greatest women's women's basketball player ever. You have uh, Nuneka, you have Chinny. Um, so you have, you have people that can kind of figure it out on their own, but he definitely has his work cut out for him. But again, man, I'm, I'm just, I'm just very, very interested and very, very um, excited to see where this season goes. And um, like I said, man, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to, you know, do my best to cover it and uh, hopefully, you know, make you guys uh, fans of the game um, as I go along. Um, and yeah, man, I, 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 I guess I'll end this, guess I'll round this out uh, with another Derek Fisher um, practice clip, actually. Uh, this is from the other day when we went to practice. Um, where is it? Uh, here we are. So again, welcome to the first episode of a uh, Sparklight, and um, yeah, hopefully you guys enjoy this. Uh, and yeah, hopefully we can take this WNBA ride together, and uh, you know, hopefully the Sparks can do some um, amazing things uh, this season. So yeah, I'm gonna leave you guys with this clip, and until next time, Sparklight. On this team, you have two um, former MVPs. You've played with one as a player. Um, is there anything that you can like kind of offer to some of the younger players about being yourself on the court around such um, talent? For sure. I mean, playing with great players is, is um, it's a gift and a curse. There are days where it makes the game easier, and then there are other days where uh, you have to respect the fact that you may not have as many opportunities as them. You may not get as many shots, um, and you have to have a really – strong mindset um, and you have to still have confidence and faith in yourself that you can play and you can make plays and that you don't have to defer um, you need to be smart and be selective but you don't have to defer to someone just because of the name on the back of their jersey one last thing before we go though like personally for me as like a fan of basketball being able to talk to somebody who uh, Kobe passed the ball to Every day, it's kind of a, it's, you know, super super cool for me being a um, fan of basketball. Like I pretty like pretty much every time I'm, you know, uh, at practice talking to fish, I'm like, yo, bro, like, bro, you hit the shot with point four seconds left, bro. Like, bro, I remember when you pulled up for three and was a game two of the finals against the Magic. Be Kobe trust you to pass you the ball, bro. So uh, yeah, man. Like I said, it's gonna be a really, really um, cool experience. I know I keep on uh, reiterating this and just uh, saying this, but really, I hope you guys take this ride with me. Again, I'm not a professional with the game yet, but I plan to be by the end of the season. Welcome to Spotlight, uh, Sparklight. Hope you enjoyed it. Until next time. Oh